It seems like these DOS videos come out one after another, but I had a chance to work a little bit more on them recently, so here we are again. Battlesport is a futuristic sports game that originally came out on 3DO and then was ported to other systems, Windows being one of them. And conceptually it's very simple, you face the opponent and it's down to which of you scores most goals before the time runs out, all in 3D FPS gameplay style. The ball bounces around the arena so you have to get to it first, grab it and then move it to the area from which you could score, all the while avoiding opponents and their fire. And it's not easy as there's quite a few weapons that they can use against you, well you can use them too if opponents hold the ball. If a player carrying the ball is shot, he loses possession, sending the ball in the direction he was going when hit. The ships can be destroyed, which forbids them from taking part in the match for a little while, giving the opponent time to score some more goals. So, combat is as important as the goals themselves are. The more matches you win, the higher your standing in the rankings will be and the more cash you will bring in, allowing you to invest in better vehicle and upgrade its defensive and offensive capabilities. Very often when the game is available on few different platforms, there's one that features best presentation, gameplay or sound design. And while Battlesport varied between those that it came out on, it shared the same addictive gameplay on all of them and was really fun. Especially in split-screen two-player mode where you get to telegraph your unquestionable superiority over your soon-to-be ex-friends. Battle Battlestorm is a port from Amiga and an always scrolling shoot em up. After years of traveling and exploring the space, you finally came back home to Earth to find it invaded by the aggressive alien forces. Now, you're you, and it's not your first interstellar rodeo, so naturally you jump into best, state-of-the-art and most heavily armed craft that you have and vouch to eradicate the invaders. As video game stories go, this one's not the best, but Battlestorm is a shooter, so who cares. The game is composed out of four levels, each divided into two smaller sub-stages. And you'll get to fight and destroy various air and ground enemies before taking on titular Battlestorm, alien headquarters and their guardians. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Battlestorm is demanding, and when I say so, I'm not throwing these words in the air. It really is. So if I could suggest something, it would be starting at the lower side of the difficulty, so that you get time to accustom to how it plays before moving to the more demanding choices. Interestingly enough, not all stages are always scrolling, some are horizontal only, while others move in vertical fashion. It may seem odd at first, but it adds a lot of the variety, and there's no such thing as too much variety in gaming. The game is difficult, we've established that already, so to combat the odds criminally stuck against you, you have pickups. And these are many. From stronger lasers to homing missiles with others like fire rate and movement speed makes for good measure. Always pick them up if you get a chance. Don't think you'll come back for one because you just need to dispose of that group of enemies that's been bothering you or whatever. If you know where a pickup is, and you will, as the pop-up messages will let you know, go and get it. They will be crucial for your survival. And Earth's future too. It's not all great though. I mean, gameplay-wise it's all fine, but the porting is of questionable quality. On Amiga, Battlestorm used 32 colors and they were everywhere. On your craft, on enemies and in the backgrounds. It looked great. And on PC, even though using VGA capable of 256 colors at once, the game looks blunt and monochromatic. I'm not sure what happened there during porting, but it's disappointing to say the least. The big three named after three leaders opposing the Axis in the World War II, so Joseph Stalin, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Winston Churchill, is an excellent example of a saying that good things come in small packages come true. Its CGA graphics are beyond dated, even for 1989, the sound and music are virtually non-existent and it doesn't feel like a lot of money went to its creation. Hence why it's in this video, I feel. But that's neither here nor there. It screams budget or even garage release. And yet, despite all that, it's a good World War II game, and a fun title for connoisseurs of the genre. It's played on a hexagonal grid and features many different kinds of units, air, ground and naval. All of them have to be built first, before they can be deployed, and you even have to secure supply chains for them, adding a lot to the realism of simulation. CPU opponent is surprisingly competent and challenging and will often keep you at the edge of your seat trying to figure out how to overcome its offensive. Shower version features three scenarios taking place on different fronts, Western, Eastern and Mediterranean during different stages of the war. And full registered copy featured three more scenarios and an additional one covering a whole conflict, the so-called Total War. Big 3 looks terrible, using the worst of all CGA palettes and there's no way going around it. But it more than makes up for it with gameplay and death that you'd not expect from a shareware release. Would I recommend playing it today? Honestly I wouldn't. And not because it's lacking in the strategy department, cause it's not. It's competent actually, at least for 1989. But there are just decades of better games to pick from today. So playing one as old and awful looking as Big 3 is just unnecessary. 
Blupo is a new take on a classic Boulder Dash formula. You play as Tichila Blupo, a chef extraordinaire, food lover and most of all entrepreneur wannabe. One day his distant relative promises him a restaurant of his own if Blupo manages to cook him a special meal. A meal to prove that cooking is a career for our little Blupo. So he finds a unique recipe that requires sweat of 3000 rare fish. Totally ignoring the fact that fish don't sweat, Blupo puts on his scuba gear and sets off underwater to collect the fish. I know, the story is super silly, but the gameplay is fun, so it's not a big deal. The game is basically underwater boulder dash in which you complete 60 increasingly difficult single player stages collecting orange fish, avoiding the yellow ones and taking care not to die. All the usual boulder dash tropes apply here too, so you gotta make sure not to have rocks fall on you, mind the exploding fish and not to lock yourself out of the exit. Not all creatures are nasty though, and some levels feature friendly fish that will eat the evil ones if given a chance. So there's that small bit of strategy added to all the puzzling too. All levels are timed and it's represented by the oxygen that Blupo has left in his tanks. He can pick up spare oxygen bottles along the way though to extend timer a little. Interestingly enough, other than the single player levels, Blupo also features another 62 player stages that you can play together with a friend. And there is fun, if not more fun, even than the single player. Well, unless you're gaming with someone who doesn't grasp the simple concept of Boulder Dash and keeps locking you out of the exit, then it's a nightmare. Bubble Pop is fun. The end. Let me try again. I'm a bit tired and not 100%. So, Bubble Pop is a fun one or two player arcade platformer not identical but similar to Bubble Bobble. The so-called evil one has turned all your animal friends evil and against you and captured your love, Bablina. Now, first things first. I think it's about time we should stop calling villains in games the evil one, as I'm sure that with extra 5 minutes of creative thinking anyone can come up with a better name. I mean, was the evil two already taken? I'm Batman! Yeah? You're right buddy, Joker and Penguin are underused in video games and are better names too. See, even Manbat needs no more than few seconds to think of something way more creative. Anyway, armed with nothing more than your magic wand, you venture through 5 huge worlds of little over 100 single screen levels to fulfill your epic quest. Each of the worlds is uniquely designed and features appropriate thematically enemies and decorations. They are Toy World, Water World, Hell World, Snow World and Blob World. Whatever that means. All of them end with an epic boss fight and they're all super fun to go through. Especially with a friend at your side. Animals zapped with your wand turn into fruit and other bonus items and die. So if you think of it, you're going through 5 cartoon worlds committing genocide. And given how colorful the game and its inhabitants are, you're kinda the evil one here. Think about it. Anyway, the wand you start with can be exchanged into 4 more powerful weapons, so with time you'll be able to spread death and destruction more efficiently, and 20 different kinds of creatures that you get to meet will all fear your name. You will become their boogeyman that they will tell tales of to their kids, their Baba Yaga, their John Wick. Or Bubble Wick, I should say really as it seems more appropriate. Bubble Pop features 20 hidden levels and finding them all will guarantee extra points for the high score table and adds a lot to the replayability. So, we're back to where I started. Bubble Pop is fun and even better with a friend. Should you play it? Definitely, it's likely to be the best multiplayer title in this video. Bashback Global Treasure Hunter is an epic and really cool sounding name for otherwise disappointing game. Because no matter how incredibly great sounding words you'll use to describe a dog poop, it will still remain a dog poop. And can never be anything else. While Bashback may not be as bad, it's an educational game and these hardly ever are very fun. Oh well, let's take a look at this one. You're Bashback and you're going to fly around the world to find and secure world's most important treasures before the nefarious Otto von Slinkenrad pockets them for himself. On a side note, Otto von Slinkenrad is a much better villain name than the evil one we saw in the previous game. So, you'll be traveling between 206 cities in 175 countries searching for clues for said treasures. On each visit you'll learn new local factoids and curiosities that may help you. In essence, Bashback is a game of hot and cold where you travel around the world gathering vague clues that work kinda like hot and cold does. So yeah, hints like it's an European country or it's not in the southern hemisphere is what you'll be finding most of the time. It's not a terrible concept but it stays questionable and unless you're a geography buff it's not very fun either. It's a bit more enjoyable if you play with someone else, but only if you both have similar grasp on geography. Cause otherwise it will be a one-sided game each time. And that gets old fast. At each game start computer will select 15 random treasures out of built-in 400 and will issue a set number of tickets to both players. Each flight obviously consumes one ticket and the game ends either when all artifacts are found or when both players run out of tickets. When that happens points are summed up and compared between the players and the winner is chosen. And that's it. The whole game. 
And while I'm a huge fan of various quizzes and quiz-like games, Bashback's focus on geography alone is its single biggest problem. Because like I pointed out before, it requires players to have similar knowledge in the subject. If they don't, one's bound to grow tired of it. While in regular quiz games, both players have disciplines in which they're more knowledgeable. So lack of that balancing limits potential fun factor and playability of Bashback considerably. Celtic Tales Baller of the Evil Eye is an isometric turn-based strategy empire building game with some role-playing elements. Evil Balor and his army of formers are the scourge of the Ireland. Neither of the tribes is strong enough to stand against them and free the country. But if they were to unite under one high king and join forces, they could stand a chance to overcome Balor and his forces. So, you must pick one of nine champions and work your way to better your clan, unite others with it under one banner and free your homeland. It's clear from the get-go that the developers did their homework as the attention to historical detail is staggering. But it's not without the touch of fantasy that we all like. The game itself is based off of four cornerstones. Four pillars of fun is what I'd like to call them. First being your clan development, so you'll need to make sure to build farms, herd animals, mine for ores and chop for wood. Not by yourself, obviously, but you get what I mean. Second is your hero and character, which is the role-playing part I mentioned initially. So this is the avatar that you play as, and you have to make sure that he will develop useful skills and progress. You do so by assigning him to specific tasks. Keep in mind that out of three classes of warrior, bard and druid, only the latter two are capable of learning and using spells. Then there's diplomacy, which as the name suggests is used for contacts with other tribes, you can wage war, form alliances, trades and caravans and create unique items. And finally, war. How is that a cornerstone for winning a game, you may wonder, especially one about uniting forces to defeat the evil? Well, while all four are important, in reality you can ignore the other three and just force your way through the game waging wars, uniting the factions via conquest and finally defeating the evil. It's not easy, but it's possible. Celtic Tales is a unique blend of strategy, management and roleplaying, and if played as developers intended, it's a lot of fun and very detailed title that will no doubt be one you'll remember fondly. If chased through combat though, while not easy to pull off, loses a bit of its appeal. Champion of the Raj is a turn-based strategy with arcade elements. The game revolves around European imperialism and colonialism in India, with six factions competing over the control of the country. British, French, Mughal Empire, Sikhs, Gurkhas and Marathas. At least three of these I've butchered pronunciation of here beyond recognition, I'm sure. The main fair of the game takes place on a strategic map where players aim to conquer all the territories of India, either by combat or peaceful diplomatic means. Combat is self-explanatory, but diplomatic takeover is only possible if a player has high enough influence in the region, he is then invited to either take part in elephant race or tiger hunting sessions. Success in either will guarantee uniting the region under player's faction. If only all conflicts around the real world could be resolved like that it would be a dream. Maybe short of shooting the tigers as these are endangered. Anyway, those arcade sequences are also presented after other notable events such as capturing of the palace of the enemy for instance. All territories that you control bring you money in taxes, which is great and can be used to better your faction, spending them on necessities or to hire or upgrade armies. Fun stuff. All factions differ in their characteristics and units quite considerably, so each will require entirely different strategy to succeed. The graphics are pretty nice in Champion of the Rush too, they're rather colorful and very stylish. It's one of those games that you would not think you'd enjoy until you actually start playing, but if given enough time, it rewards players with fun and unique challenge. Champions of Zulala Elite Edition is a very unusual take on the versus fighting genre and an expanded version of year prior's first game. It features 24 different fighters, because I can't really call them characters as some of them are not humanoids, different bosses and multiple gameplay modes. Zulala is a town in the mystical land of Akistar that is not known for its monuments, food or even tourist hotspots. Not the case here whatsoever. It is however hosting famous martial tournaments. And that fame spread around the world like a wildfire, sparking interest in hearts of any and all fighters of all kinds, human or otherwise. All that crave validation of being the best make their way to the city where they will fight in a tournament to find the one. At the game start you have to create your character picking between many races. And the game uses the word race quite liberally, as as much as a troll or mud golem can be considered a race, a thief or warlock really aren't. But I'm splitting her here, point is, you create a character and pick who slash what he is. The game can hold many of these at the time and keeps detailed statistics for all of them. There's four main gameplay modes to choose from and they are single fight, which is kinda self-explanatory. You pick a fighter and then opponent for him that will be CPU controlled and then you fight him. Then there's the elimination tournament, which is basically a standard tournament where from each battle only one fighter goes ahead until only two end in the final battle. 
There's also a so-called 20 monsters bash, which drops four different enemies on the screen at once, and they all fight each other at once. Whenever any of them dies, a new one jumps into the fight until all are gone, and only one lives in a Christopher Lambert's Highlander style, meaning that there can be only one. And finally, there's the challenge the Evil Lord mode, which kinda explains itself too. Basically, it's like single fight, but against the game's bosses. Fighting mechanics of Champions of Zulala are simplistic, primitive even, featuring couple of attack types for each fighter, jump and block. Nothing more. No explosive specials or finishes. You could say that it makes the game boring and short stay, and I get that, but it's fun for how unique it is, even if it doesn't offer the same replayability as other giants of the genre do. Believe it or not, but the last game for today is also a versus fighter. It's more classic in its design though and follows the true and tried formula rather than inventing anything particularly unique or unusual. After years of bloody intergalactic wars, a fragile peace was formed between all the cosmic races. To sustain it and to keep the aggressive temperaments in check, an annual tournament is announced, so that all the former enemy races can send their best warriors to compete for the prestigious title of the Hero of the Universe. There's one thing I gotta know here. If the tournament is annual and all fighters come from different planets in different solar systems with different lengths of days and years, how do we pick which year is the year for the tournament? Is it Earth's or some other planets? Well, we will never know, but it's interesting to think about nonetheless. All fighters are appropriately different, representing their planets of origin. Each of them fights in a unique style and features different moves and special attacks, ranged or otherwise. Violent Vengeance can be played in standard 2-player versus mode or single-player tournament, where you go through series of fighters that culminate with epic boss fights. These bosses are more extraordinary than the tournament participants and obviously pose bigger challenge to beat. The presentation is pretty decent overall, sound design is good and all the attacks, shouts and grunts you'd expect from a box standard fighter are here and are well telegraphed. Graphics are colorful with decently large sprites and interesting design. Same can be said about backgrounds, which are lush and even feature some basic animated elements here and there. What could be improved though is the fighters' animations that feel like they could use 3 4 frames more for each attack to feel fluid and less jumpy. I mean, it's not terrible, but it lacks that extra final touch to be more than just average. As it stands, it's just that. Middle of the road in the genre. Not great, not terrible, somewhere in between, forgotten by time. How do we find today's selection? Was it interesting? Did you find any new titles to check out? Let me know and let's discuss it in the comments below. If you liked the video, hit those like and subscribe buttons below. If you didn't, well, then there's thumbs down there too. But I suppose you wouldn't have persevered up to this point if you really didn't. Around 60% of you are not subscribed and there's currently no way of knowing if YouTube will decide to recommend you the next episode or not, other than subscribing and hitting that bell, that is. And when you hit that bell, whenever the new video is out, YouTube will actually send you a small and friendly notification about it, so you wouldn't miss it. If you'd like to support the channel, Patreon and YouTube memberships are a great way of doing so, they will help me release better content and also they get first dips on all new videos before they're publicly accessible on YouTube. If you can't or don't want to do that though, likes and subscribes are great too. I would like to take a moment here and thank all the YouTube creators from whose videos short bits were taken to serve as a background to my commentary. They're amazing and stars among the retro community. You will find names of their channels at the top of the screen when their footage is running and also in the video description below. For me though, this is all, so have a good one and I'll see you next time. Peace.